I must confess to you that when I think about the invitation to enter into a holy Lent, it is my temptation to treat that in the most superficial of ways. Meaning, what I do is basically dissolve it down into what am I going to give up? And what am I going to take on in terms of Lenten disciplines? And then do my best to take this construct of how I see myself and add those things to it in a way that still keeps that construct intact. After all, I have obligations and things to do. And I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I'm a bishop, I'm all kinds of things. And I have a new dog of all things. There's plenty to already occupy my life. And I can't violate those. So how can I squeeze this in and still do everything that needs to be done? You see, that is the most minimalist way, sorry, bad English, of trying to think about this, to, be, to reduce it in essence to a series of tasks. A friend of mine I follow on Twitter called the invitation into Lent a dark wood. And I resonated deeply with that. It's not dissimilar to the reaction I had a couple of weeks ago when the gospel lesson was called Love Your was in Love Your Enemies. And I confessed to the group to whom I was preaching that um, you know, I have every single objection in the world why that is a totally unworkable way to live. Terrible way of thinking about foreign policy, self-preservation, et cetera, et cetera. All I can think of, you see, were my objections. And therefore, what I did was see the call to love your enemies as something way over here. And realized that if I was even going to begin to approach it, I had to let Jesus take me there and work whatever changes he wanted to make in me so that when I finally encountered that verse, there would be room in my heart to receive what it was that Jesus wanted to say to me through that verse. It's another way of saying, my job is to keep myself intact and not let anything get in the way of that. There's already way too much to manage. Similarly, is this call to Lent. If how I begin to enter into Lent is to think about how I can remain who I am and then take on these other tasks, that is actually an act of self-preservation, not so much an act of yieldedness. Because in the same way that loving your enemy for me is like over there, and I need Jesus to take me there. The call to repentance is the same. Because I can take on all of those disciplines and still just be me and never wrestle with the deeper call to repentance that is in fact the true meaning of Lent. It's never about what we give up. It's instead how we are changed. God has, through his church, provided a process where we can create within us, by God's mercy, the space to begin to be changed. It are, it's the things that will be read in the exhortation after the conclusion of this sermon. The reading of God's word, prayer, fasting, self-denial, almsgiving. Those, in fact, are the things that God has provided for his church to begin to take me from the place of where I am, committed to my own way of remaining intact, into this dark wood of a call to repentance where I don't know what is going to be around the next tree. I don't know what's going to happen when I get into that dark wood. It raises all kinds of questions and fears about personal safety and all the what ifs that show up when I'm challenged to walk in a way that I cannot anticipate the solution. And that's precisely the point. So long as I live with a commitment to remain intact as I am. I will live 
in the very ways that particularly the Gospel of Matthew challenges me on. Because at the heart of showing your piety toward others and laying up treasures for yourself, all of those are symptoms of the desire to keep my life intact, whole, managed well, in control. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to have enough for it to retire on. And yet, to go into that dark wood, what if God asks something of me in almsgiving? that is beyond what I think my checkbook can afford? What if God decides to break open my schedule and pull in me into things that are way over my head? All of the what ifs arise because there are no guarantees, seemingly, to be able to go into that dark wood and actually find my way out onto the other side. But that is exactly the invitation of Lent, to be willing to, in essence, take the hand of God and to do that in the ways that have been described, prayer, fasting, the reading of God's word, almsgiving, and allowing him through that to work in me a process of change where I begin to face in whole new ways my desire to be self-sufficient, my commitment to please others above almost everything else, including pleasing God at times. All of the things that Jesus is not so gently saying, this is not what it means to be my follower, begins to get into me in a way that is actually meant to be my own transformation. If I'm going to in any way begin to walk in the life of faith that is being asked of me. I have to be willing from time to time, not just once, go into that dark wood, be led into practices, ways, and circumstances that are beyond anything that I can personally control, where all I have is, well, God, you brought me in this, so I'm trusting you're going to get me out, and that's all I got. Of course, God knows that. You see, the glory of this invitation is that God is utterly and completely committed to shattering our self-sufficiency. It's ruthless. It is warlike. And it feels entirely unfair. And yet, through those very experiences, I finally have to learn how to cast all my care upon him because he cares for me. I finally have to learn how to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. I have to learn because Lord, where else can we go? You are the one who has the way and is the way of eternal life. <coughs> That is saying yes to this invitation to Lent. And it is, above all, an act of faith in the goodness of God, in the glory of the grace that he gives us to bring about repentance that we can never, ever create on our own. To know that, in fact, to go into that dark wood is a new invitation to discover mercies that we would never know in the midst of our own sufficiency. The power of God to break through in our circumstances that we didn't need before because we had all this managed, thank you very much. And out of that, discover new things about God. Because in the end, Lent is about God and God's work in us and his relentless commitment to remove, remold, and change us into his own likeness that we might be able, by God's mercy, to let our light so shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Lent is really, in the end, not about our own perfection. Instead, it is an invitation to breakage and remold so that the light of God that has been placed within us might shine through us in a way that causes others to see, know, and be drawn to him. It is to that 
that we are saying yes. In other words, Lent is an invitation to be remade so that he might use us for his glory. It is a dark wood. I can't in any way somehow minimalize that. There is fear. There's a woman I follow, her name is Beth Moore. She's a major star in the Southern Baptist Church, particularly among Bible studies. She's recently joined one of the Anglican churches and she posted on Twitter this morning, I'm about to go into Lent and the thought terrifies me. And I thought, right, right. Because we're saying yes to big things. But we also trust that we have a very big God who will hold us in the palm of our hand, his hands and never let us go. Amen.